Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Thank you for being with us here this Sunday. If you would, join with us as we sing this song, as we ask God to come on earth as in heaven. There is peace in your presence. We are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. In your presence, there is truth. In your presence, mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you. Psalm 23, it says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Between services, I ran and grabbed this brick from my office. Some of you may uh, recognize this brick. This is a brick that I held up at the very first uh, 1042 service at the one-year anniversary. Uh, Andrew, you can keep underscoring if you would like. Uh, at the very uh, first 1042 and at the one-year anniversary. And what this brick is is an original brick from 180 years ago when the building was first laid, uh, just from right back here. Don't worry, it's not a load-supporting brick. We're all safe. Uh, but this brick reminds me, less so now because we're not in our offices, but this brick reminds me that God has been with First Press Westchester for 180 years. Um, and in times of pandemic and transition, that is something that is helpful to remember. Um, if you think about it, God's been with his church through the Civil War, uh, through World War I and World War II, through the Spanish flu, the pandemic in 1918. There's been all kinds of stuff, world history events that God has seen this church through. And so as we are in this time of transition and in this pandemic, separated from each other, I want us to remember, and I hope that we can remember that God is the one that is lighting our way through this darkness. God is the one who is lighting the way through these circumstances in our path. So would you join us in this next song? There's a song of resurrection A hope that fills the weary soul You have made your home inside I'm not alone In the shadow of the valley your word my flesh and I can see May I not forget the promise leading me You're leading me You light the way You light the way With a fire by night And a cloud by day You light the way Pilgrims on a journey, hungry for what lies beyond. Strangers once, now they are family. We belong. We are tellers of a story. Future, you're lighting up my faith. 
Thank you for your faithfulness that we have seen, God, in this church, in our lives, God, in our families, in our community. God, and as we uh, continue to walk with you, God, we just ask that we uh, would see and know your presence. We love you and we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you and welcome to the service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Caroline. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to thank you for spending part of your Memorial Day weekend with us. And if you are watching on Facebook or participating in the service that way, leave a message, say hello to one another, and um, so that we can share the spirit of hospitality even when we're separate from each other. Um, as you can see, our building remains closed in light of the pandemic. But we are closely watching CDC guidelines, listening to our local authorities, and we are working staff, session, trustees on a phased reopening plan that we will communicate as we have more information. And we'll keep you updated on all of these transitions as we have them. If you've been receiving messages from us this week, you've heard, no doubt, about the upcoming pastoral transition with Greg accepting a call um, to serve at First Presbyterian Church in New York City. Um, we will have much more information as we go through this process together. I love that Greg, sh um, that Eric shared that brick, that First Pres has been here through much. We will be here, God willing, through much more. And we are a church family who worships, prays, sings, and serves together, regardless of who is standing up here on the chancel. Uh, we are continuing to go through this time of pandemic, and many of you have reached out asking how you can help. We have a new page on our website we mentioned last week called Helping Hands. It's a place where you can request uh, grocery delivery, somebody to talk to, pray with, um, help with some light yard work, or if you have something to offer and give, this would be a place where you could uh, s share what you have to offer as well. If you have any questions about that, ask Elizabeth Hess, our Congregational Life Coordinator. And a uh, reminder that digital VBS registrations are open on the website. This is a virtual program for kids age three through rising fifth grade, all done online on your schedule wherever you may be. If you have questions about that, reach out to Sarah Pantazis. And speaking of Sunday school, we have a very special person to wish happy birthday to. Sandy Preston's birthday is tomorrow, Memorial Day. Um, Sandy is a stalwart of this congregation, a lifelong member. If you've been here uh, and participated in Sunday school for over the past, I think, 40 years, Sandy has been your teacher at some point along the journey. If you've come through bridge dinner, she is the friendly face greeting you. She is one of the hearts and souls of this congregation. And I wish we could sing to her this morning. I think the kids did on Zoom Sunday School. But leave her a word of greeting and happy birthday celebrations. Sandy, we love you and we miss you, and we hope that we can celebrate with you soon. Um, as we move into this time of prayer, we have lost a number of people in our congregation over the past week. So we ask that as these names are read, you hold their families in prayer. We pray for the family of Bill Fox. We pray for the family and friends of Betty Stanley. We pray for the family of Betty Limberger. We pray for the family of Betty Kalmbach. And we pray for the family of Jack Lemley. Will you pray with me? Great God, we come to you today with hearts that are full of longing memories, 
and desire for a world without death or suffering. We give you thanks for bringing us through another week of separation, for the bread that has sustained us along this journey. We pray with grief for all who have died, both from this insidious virus and also from all of the ways that our bodies fail us, from war, from violence, from broken hearts. Especially today, we pray for the families of Bill Fox, Bunny Stanley, Betty Limberger, Betty Kalmbach, and Jack Herman, that you surround them with your care and the trust in your promises. We thank you for welcoming them safely home where they are without pain or illness, greeted by family and friends. We pray for all who suffer as the result of conflict and ask that you give us your peace. Today, this Memorial Day weekend, we pray for members of the armed forces in this and every nation, for all who are in danger, for their families and their loved ones. May the leaders of this world incline their hearts toward peace and never ask for the sacrifice of your children for anything less than their most noble purpose. We pray for peacemakers and keepers, for all who guide and, and teach, and all of those whose memories we cherish. We ask for your healing in those relationships filled with hurt and complexity which were not resolved before death, that your reconciliation and forgiveness might extend beyond the grave. We pray for our church as we go through this time of transition, for Greg and his family, that you give them your strength in the midst of all that is unknown. Give our congregation wisdom and patience as you guide us into the next chapter of our lives together. Help us to be discerning, to listen deeply to your voice, and to follow where you lead. We trust that even now you are stirring the hearts of the ones who will lead us in the months and the years to come, and we look forward with hope and anticipation to all that has yet to be revealed to us. We thank you also that you are with us in togetherness and in separation, through the word read and proclaimed, the sound of your praises sung, the bread held and broken, and the waters of baptism that roll through us still. Lift up all of our prayers, those spoken aloud, and those held in the silence of our hearts. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to live and love and pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the time in the service when we would typically speak about the giving of our lives and our labor as a sign of our faithfulness in God, who has given us all. If you are willing and able, we ask that you might consider making a gift through our website to support the ministries of this church and God's work in the world.
I love it when our church members read scripture online, when they record the, cert- the readings ahead of time and then we play them during the service. Uh, today, however, we're doing things a little differently. And the reason for doing things differently, for this to be a very different kind of a sermon, is because the reading today, the one that Paul wrote to the Philippian church, is basically the sermon in a nutshell. The sermon itself should be just about six verses long. The words from Paul, the ones that Paul writes to the Philippian church, are exactly, and I do mean exactly what I want to say today. So I want to let you know, this is a very different kind of sermon. It has two simple points, no more, just two points, no surprises, no twists, no turns. And these are words that you already know to be true. The first one is simply this, I thank my God for you. And the second one is, God is not done yet. Before we read scripture, let us pray. Gracious God, startle us once more with the power of your word. Speak to us your word which never changes. Pour upon us your gifts of preaching and understanding that our lives may be changed. We pray this with anticipation in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Listen for God's word to you from Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 1. In it, Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Sunday evening, you all received an email speaking of my leaving. Monday morning, the downtown Starbucks closed its doors for good. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, Friends, you have no idea how many people have actually emailed me about it or texted me or posted it on Facebook. Someone actually said that I had given Starbucks so much money over the years that now they knew I was moving, it was time for the well to run dry and move on. Somebody else said that they heard I was leaving and they cut their losses and closed up. Uh, Many variations of that. I smiled at every single one of those posts. One, however, there was one post that really got me thinking. Someone actually said, Starbucks closing, you're leaving, is it a sign? And of course the answer is no, it's not a sign, but, but it got me thinking about this whole idea of signs and how God speaks. Do you believe in signs? Or even a better way to speak about it is, do you think that God speaks to you? That God speaks in signs or in many other ways? And, and in that case, how does God speak to us, to you and to me and to the church? How does God call? How does God lead one another? Well, in my case, as you know, I'm speaking about discernment and discernment of a call. And I have to tell you, discernment is hard. But I also want to say that discernment of a call is not a one-time deal for pastors. It's an everyday thing for anyone who is a Christian. The sermon of God's leading is not only for clergy, but it's for every single one of you watching at home, even today. It's for every single person who calls himself a Christian. Remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 23 that was read a few moments ago when when it reads, He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God leads. But how? How does God lead me? How does God lead you in your everyday lives? Speaking of this new call, one of the many questions I've been asked this week through emails and texts and phone calls and one-on-one video conferences, and by the way, thank you for all of those emails and for your support and for the exchanges that we've been able to have. One of the main questions that I've been asked, aside from asking where are you going and what's it like, is why? Why are you leaving? And someone ventured a guess. They said, is it 
the allure of the lights and the big city and the museums and the theater and the answers? No, that's, that's not it. As much as those things feel like home and I really, really enjoy them, no, that's not it. One of you actually asked, is it because of something that happened here at First Press? And no, the answer is no, not at all. Somebody said, is there anything that we could have done to keep you here? And the answer is also no, because it, it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. And then one of you actually did say, is it because you don't love us anymore? And, oh my word, that one really got to me. It really did. It couldn't be further from the truth. I'll get way too emotional if I start talking about it and list the many, many ways that you've been a blessing in my own life that have enriched my life and my ministry and the unspeakable amount of reasons why it's a joy to be your pastor. We'll get to that at some point, I promise. We'll leave that for nine weeks, ten weeks from now. But, but for now, suffice it to say that the way I feel is the way that Paul feels. Suffice it to say that the words of Paul that were read a few moments ago are also my words today. When Paul says in chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. I read those words earlier this week and thought to myself, that's exactly what I want to say. And I mean exactly what I want to say today. I thank God for you. These are familiar words. The first time I came across them were not in the context of worship, were there many years ago back in high school. You see, I had a friend, his name was Bob, and Bob wrote these words in a different way. He wrote it on the yearbook of a girl that he had a crush on a girl that he really, really liked. And so he stole her yearbook and wrote down right there, Dear Becky, Philippians 1-3. <laughs> Becky saw it, and of course she went and grabbed her Bible and tried to find out what on earth was Bob saying. And of course she opened it and read the words, I thank God every time I think of you. Bob told me about the move, and I said, Man, that's slick. It's horribly out of context, but it's very slick, no question about it. You see... Paul is not speaking here about a romantic kind of love or romantic partner. Paul is speaking about the church. And not just the church at large, capital C, a very specific church in a very specific time. He writes this letter, which is a beautiful, joy-filled letter, full of joy and hope. I encourage you to sit down and read all four chapters in one sitting, and you will find that joy for this church oozes in its pages. Some say that he wrote this letter from prison. Most scholars agree that he wrote this joy-filled letter from prison. Some believe he was in Ephesus. Most believe he was imprisoned in Rome. Think about Paul. His future was uncertain. His life was on the line. He could face death any moment. And so in the middle of that uncertainty, Paul actually writes, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he writes so with joy. He writes in uncertain times with his life on the line, and yet he manages to write with hope and joy. I think that's something worth noting, that our joy in Christ is not dependent on things being easy or the same, that our joy in Christ is not dependent on constancy or good or bad news, on certainty or uncertainty. I always ask myself, especially these days, questions that really have no answer. Questions personally like, what awaits me in ministry a few months from now? And the answer is, I have no idea. I ask questions like, what's in store for my family with this move? And the answer is, I really don't know. I ask questions about the fact that it is New York City in the middle of a pandemic. They've been through so much already. And the question is, what will the city look like three months from now or six months from now or a year from now? And the answer to those questions is, I have absolutely no idea. Shine a spotlight here in Westchester, and the questions are very similar. What about First Press? What will this church look like three months from now, six months from now, a year from now? I don't know. What kind of pastor is God already calling and forming who will minister here in this congregation whom you will welcome with open arms? The answer is, I, I don't know. What kind of hurdles will you encounter in your search? All of these questions above, the answer is exactly the same. I have absolutely no idea, but I do know this. In all of life, God is constant, and God is faithful. 
As we read in Paul's letter, our joy in Christ does not depend on circumstances, so much so that later on in the letter he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice in case we didn't get it the first time. So he writes with joy and with hope these opening verses, and he writes with overflowing gratitude for a church, a gratitude for a church that he loves. And today I say, I know how he feels. I really do. I thank God every time I remember you. To which some of you might be wondering, so why leave then? I've heard pastors give many pat-on-the-back cliché kind of answers to that question, but in reality, that kind of cliche answer, I don't have a better one. The way that I think about this, there is only one answer, and believe it should be true, and that is God's call. Whether you want to call it God's call or God's leading or God's prompting, the answer will still be the same as best as I understand it. And the same answer is in your life for your own decisions. It is the best that you can experience God's own call. Yes, but how do you know, you might say, how do you know that what you hear and what you feel and what I hear, what each of us experiences in life is actually God calling? Well, that's a great question. How much time do you have? It's a complex answer when it comes to following God. I've heard pastors, for example, speak of their own call stories, and some of them speak with great certainty, and and I have a hard time relating to that. I heard a pastor once say that she experienced God's call this way. God pretty much took her heart and took it to a new place, and she had no choice but to follow her heart. It sounds good, and it sounds poetic, but I am way too analytical for that. I, I don't work that way. That is not how God works with me. Some other pastors speak about a mystical experience, overflowing peace, divine certainty, an actual voice speaking to them, a vision, but... But that hasn't happened to me. I'm I'm not like that. So much so that one pastor, speaking to me a few years ago, told me very animatedly how he was selected as pastor of a large congregation in Latin America. We're sitting in his story, and he told me how the senior pastor of that large congregation died, and, and so a new successor was to be chosen from within the congregation. And so the way they did it is they gathered 35 of their elders and they met in what they call the upper room and they began to pray earnestly, all 35 of them in loud voices. It was a charismatic church. And so they were begging to God, 35 of them in loud voices, that God would show them who God was already calling. Well, my friend said that three hours into the prayer, can you believe it, three hours into the prayer as their voices were soaring in that place one of the elders looked up saw my friend ran across the room and tackled him you heard it right tackled him immediately as as if on cue a second elder turned and tackled him as well and piled up more and then two more less than 20 seconds later there's a pile of loud praying human beings on top of this pastor as others are wondering who is it who is it that god called My friend is all excited, sitting in his office with a twinkle in his eye, telling me about the story, and then he says, isn't that awesome? To which I say, no, that's a little scary, man. (laughs) I'm not sure that it works that way for everyone. I respect them. Some people are led to God that way. Some people are led by God through a burning bush or a voice they hear from heaven, or drinking water from a rock, or following a fiery pillar, or they see a dead man raised from the dead. They put their hands in the nail marks on his hands. They see a bright light on the road to Damascus. But as I think of my own life, it rarely happens that way. And I I venture a guess that it doesn't always happen that way for you. How do you hear God's voice in your own life? Because it's not only about pastors and their calling. It's about the calling of every child of God. It is not only about pastoral ministry or the future of a church. It is about the everyday action in every one of our lives, the huge decisions and the small decisions. It has to do with your own family decisions. It has to do with having your fears calmed in the middle of a pandemic, about having your loneliness met, about having patience as the world rushes forward. It's about looking after those who are more 
most vulnerable, even if I am not. It's about writing injustice. It's about allowing your life to be used for the betterment of the life of others. It's about the enormous things in life, and it's about the small, everyday work of your hands, your words, your thoughts, your smiles, and your tears. So in all of this, I have to ask, how do you hear the voice of God in your life? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I, I really, really don't. There's an old poem that some of you like, and you might even have it um, framed at home. It's called Footprints in the Sand. Have you seen it? Google it if, if you're there listening and haven't heard it. It speaks of a man who sees his life as footprints. There are, apparently, as he looks back in his life on the sand, there are two sets of footprints with God's prints right beside him walking together throughout life. And once in a while during the difficult times in life, there's only one set of footprints. The man turns to God and says, those were difficult times in my life. Why did you leave me? And God says, no, I didn't leave you. When you see one set of footprints, it's because I carried you. It's a nice poem. It's, it's comforting, no question about that. It's a useful poem to read about times of trouble and God's presence with us. I get it. But when it comes to God's leaving in our lives, I'm not sure that it works that way, at least not for me. I, I, I wish it were, I really do, but the psalm doesn't say he carries me beside still waters. He says he leads me beside still waters. The psalm doesn't say he carries me in paths of righteousness. It says leads. I wish it said carried because life would be so much easier, but no, it doesn't. It says lead. And to tell you the truth, I'm convinced at times it should say drag. But no, it says lead. As God leads in my life, in your life, all that we can try to do is follow. Follow as best as we know how to. Hope to do so faithfully. Hope that we know how. Hope that what we hear is the voice of God calling. Hope that the church speaks to it as well. Because being carried is easy. Following is not. It's a lot harder. A lot, lot harder. I'll tell you how it works in my life, but in your life it might work differently. In my own life, the way it works is so non-mystical. I pray, and then I listen. And then I pray again and listen again. And then I pray once more, and then I seek counsel. I pray again and seek the counsel of people that I trust and people that I love. And I pray once more, and then once it's all prayed for and thought about, I take a very small step and then look back and see if it was a good and pleasing step to God. And if it was, I take one more step. If not, I take a step back and pray again, and then one and another and another step. It's non-mystical. For some of you, and I respect that tremendously, being faithful is a matter of certainty, at least for me in my own life. Being faithful is different. Being faithful, in the words of the great Bill of Joel, it's a matter of trust. It's always been a matter of trust. Which is why, even if I thank God every time I remember you, which is why, even if it's hard to leave, I trust that God is the one who is leading, and I follow, and we follow as best as we can. The Apostle Paul, however, doesn't stop there. Remember that I said that this was a very different kind of sermon, two points only, very straightforward, no twists and turns. The first one we've spoken about, I thank God for you. The second one, God is not done yet. Far from it. As Eric said, the church has been here for over 180 years, and I believe God is just getting started. Did you hear it in today's reading? God is a God of promise, and this is God's promise. Let me read once more verse 6. Paul writes, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion completion by the day of Jesus Christ. How does that work? Well, many of you know that I've always been fascinated by technology. And just like some of you uh, get rid of your stress by knitting or playing golf or restoring furniture or running or journaling or baking, my getting de-stressed is different. My getting rid of stress comes from doing computer animation. 
And if you're wondering what that looks like, well, you've probably seen some of those movies like Toy Story or Frozen or Onward. That's the kind of stuff I absolutely love to do in my basement at night. Late at night when everybody's asleep, I put away anything related to church and I get rid of all the stress of the day by putting on a movie in the background and animating computer characters. A few months ago, I was working on the animation of a woodpecker. You might wonder, why on earth a woodpecker? Pecker? Well, I was sitting behind our house once, and I saw one. I was fascinated to see how violently those little things whack their heads against the tree and not get a concussion. So I went ahead and researched it, and I downloaded some ultra-slow-motion references and studied their skull anatomy and began over the course of a month or so to animate a woodpecker as real as I could get it, as real as I possibly could, when the month was over of working in it, just about 15 seconds or so, I was very proud of it. I uploaded it to a forum that is made of professionals in the field. These are the artists that actually work in making movies. And I clicked on the upload button and just waited for the feedback. And sure enough, a few minutes later, the first piece of feedback came by. And I was excited about it because it came from somebody I know, one of the people who worked in the latest Toy Story movie. And he began his critique with the words, not great job, but great start. Oh, talk about being demoralizing. Great start. I thought it was a finished piece. Here I went ahead and went through the whole process. I blocked it, I polished it, then I dressed it up, played with the textures, the light, and considered a finished piece and uploaded the baby. And that's where he calls it, no, it's not a finished piece. It's just starting. It's a good work in progress. It's a good whip. Do you know what that means? Whip, have you heard it before? It's a term used in computer graphics a lot, but many other places in life. Whip stands for work in progress. And it's an important acronym because I believe, and I believe that Paul does too, that this is who we are as Christians and as a church. God's sacred whip. God's holy work in progress. Because God, as I said, is not done yet. Paul writes, the one who began a good work among you will see it to completion. Among you. And that is not a singular you, even though we love to see ourselves as God's handiwork, our lives modeled by the clay master. Paul here does not speak in singular. It's a plural you. As I've told you before, it's not just you, it's you all. All you all. It's the church itself together. We are God's holy whip, work in progress. As I said, this is not a complicated sermon. It has two points only. I thank God for you. And God is not done yet. God is at work in you. You might wonder, a work to do what? To go where? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does completion look like? Will it hurt? Will it be exciting? How long will it take? And the answer is the same as it's been all throughout the sermon. I have no idea. But it's not a matter of knowledge, is it? It's a matter of trust. And I trust in a God who builds the church in Pennsylvania, in New York, in Guatemala, and to the very ends of the earth. Oh, friends, God is faithful. We shall not want. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. Will you pray with me? God Almighty, we thank you for your leading. When we are able to see it and hear it and when we cannot. We thank you for you lead us throughout this life, not just carry us. We thank you, Almighty God, that you are with us and with us individually and with this church. And we pray for your blessing in the precious name of Christ. Amen.